I think it's um, poignant that we are studying about the end of this gospel in the very time that we celebrate the beginning of it. We didn't plan it that way. We just happened to be studying through the gospel of Luke and Oddly enough, we had one visiting speaker this past fall. You know, this is 24 weeks of study, and we had one visiting speaker who interrupted our plan, which pushed us into this date. And so here we are today, a few days before Christmas, and we're studying about the death, yes, last week, and the resurrection of Jesus this week, and finishing this gospel on the very time when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. I appreciated the one of the hymns we, we sang this morning that actually made reference to that culmination that we're reading about here. I put on Facebook um, a comment about this study, and one of our missionaries uh, commented back saying, it really isn't odd at all. Jesus' whole purpose in coming, his birth in Bethlehem was for this moment in history in these three days of suffering, death, and then resurrection. That is the culmination. So it's, um, like I said, poignant that we're studying this today. So we come to the end of Luke's gospel. And you know, Luke is a physician and uh, He is probably the most educated and articulate of all the gospel writers. He's very precise. He's organized. He's thorough. He makes a case to a person named Theophilus when he writes the book of Luke saying, I have done a lot of research and put this in order. He also wrote the book of Acts, which is almost like a sequel to his gospel of Luke, beginning where Luke ends. So this chapter, of course, is unified around a single theme of Christ's resurrection. A lot of different people in this story. There's these women who visit the tomb very early, it says, Sunday morning, and discover that the stone is rolled away and Jesus' body is missing. There are two men in bright, shining clothes, Luke says, who tell them that Jesus is not dead. He's risen from the dead. There are 11 apostles, obviously missing Judas, who had committed suicide, to whom these women went with this news. And when they got there, the, the 11 apostles thought they were speaking nonsense, the scripture says. Of course, in that group of 11, there's Peter, the proactive one, who always is doing something. He leaves the group, runs to the tomb to see for himself. A little bit later, there's these two followers of Jesus, one of them named Cleopas, who are walking from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, and they are joined by Jesus on the road. Then, again, a little later, there's the 11 apostles again, disciples who are gathered with others, and Jesus appears in their midst, and he shows them his hands and his feet. It doesn't say it, but I can imagine that he's showing them the wounds. He asks them to touch him. He offers to eat something, and they hand him a piece of fish, and he eats fish to prove to them that he is not a ghost, but flesh and bones. He speaks in that meeting to them from the Old Testament about the promised resurrection and God's plan, God's plan to raise him from the dead that the gospel might be preached. This gospel that that Luke says is the gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sins. To all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Finally, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem until God sends them the power of the Holy Spirit. At the very end of the chapter, he leads them out to the out of the city of Jerusalem to to Bethlehem, where he blesses them and ascends into heaven. 
You know, the resurrection, if we're really, really down deep inside of ourselves, honest, it's impossible. We're not really that much different than Jesus' disciples. It's difficult to believe that anyone can actually come back to life after being dead. People don't rise from the dead. Of all the things about life and existence, death is the one undoable experience. And we have a modern cliche, a death sentence. And it sums up really our view about death's finality. Death is the final, permanent end of everything. So resurrection isn't natural or normal to our thinking. The idea of dead people coming back to life is an oddity. It's something akin to fairy tales where zombies and vampires live. It's not reality. It's not normal human experience. And when a loved one dies, intelligent thinking people do not assume or expect that they will come back to live with us again. So death is this last mysterious doorway from which there is no return. And that is precisely why Jesus' death at Calvary was so devastating to all his followers. Trevor talked about this last week. Jesus had repeatedly predicted that he would rise from the dead, but his death and resurrection talk really did not become embedded in the disciples' expectations. We see that here. Right here in this chapter, there are two of them, Cleopas and another, were walking to Emmaus, talking about his recent death. And one of the things that they said in that conversation, they said, we had hoped that he was the one. The one. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That one sentence, you can hear their deep disappointment and grief. Ironically, when they said it, they were talking with Jesus. (laughs) He had appeared to them and entered the conversation and they didn't recognize him. So the resurrection is a miracle. Jesus repeatedly predicted this event, that he would die and that he would rise again after three days. And even though the disciples never really got it during its initial talk, it wasn't until later, the actually, actually the predictions were widely known. Jesus talked about it enough that this idea was widely known in the culture. They were not really taken seriously, but predictions, the predictions scared the Jewish leaders, and they, it prompted them to act. So after Jesus died on the, on the cross, they asked Pilate to put a guard at the tomb. Why did they do that? To keep Jesus' disciples from stealing his body and claiming that he had risen from the dead. And then when the guards failed... And the soldiers came running back to the priests with the news, probably scared for their lives. The priests paid them off, telling them to keep quiet about what they had seen and promising to protect them from court-martial and probably execution. We know that the uh, widely influential Sadducean sect who are present throughout Jesus' ministry They refuted resurrection and theology outright, including all talk about life after death beliefs. In their worldview, death was the end. When you died, life was over. Your soul didn't continue to exist, and you didn't go to paradise or heaven or Hades or Sheol or anywhere else because there was no place to go. Resurrection talk was a continual point of contention between the Sadducees and Jesus. As you might remember from our study, they were constantly trying to trip him up on this point. But to their chagrin, he openly talked about eternity. 
heaven, hell, death, and resurrection. This is an important subject, and Jesus was not going to evade it. The Sadducean skepticism still exists today. It's pretty rampant in Western culture. Despite overwhelming evidence of the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection, people today still choose to believe what is easier to believe. That is, that Jesus was a popular Jewish rabbi who died an untimely and unfortunate death at the hands of the Romans on a Roman cross, but he didn't rise from the dead, even though his teachings and popularity bird the new religion called Christianity. And if you think about it, in fairness to the skeptics, the idea of resurrection is a pretty outrageous claim. <clears throat> Skeptics have suggested many scenarios about Christ's resurrection and how it was a hoax. One suggests that he really didn't die, he only swooned. Which, I think, this claim is actually more outrageous than a claim of resurrection. Think about it. <clears throat> after all the beatings, after hanging on a cross with nails in his hands and feet for hours, after being stabbed with a sword in his chest, he's still alive? When the guards checked him, they didn't even break his legs, which was a normal procedure for those hung on a Roman cross, because they observed that he was already dead. So they take him down from the cross, and he's put in a tomb, and now he's in this tomb, and so how did this mortally wounded... If he wasn't dead, he was definitely going to die. How did this mortally wounded, half-dead man wiggle out of tightly wrapped burial cloths, crawl to the tomb entrance, roll away a two-ton stone, and scare off a squad of guards? If he had done all of this, the only really believable part is the fact that he would have actually scared the crap out of those guards. <laughs> You talk about zombies. <laughs> the undead. Another argument recorded as a Jewish rumor actually in the biblical record is that the disciples stole his body and made it all up. Again, not plausible. Think about it. A motley bunch of cowards who ran for their lives when Jesus was arrested now boldly return to the tomb, overpower a squad of armed Roman guards, and steal Jesus' body. There are more such speculations, but here's probably the craziest one. The disciples ate psychedelic mushrooms and hallucinated Jesus. All of them. For 40 days. <laughs> That would have been a party. <clears throat> it's much easier to simply believe the biblical account that Jesus actually raised from the dead. No other world religion claims that our leader overcame that their leader overcame death and still lives. Gautama Buddha died around 400 BCE. No one disputes that he is dead. In fact, they worship his remains. Tombs containing parts of the Buddha's body are all over the world. I visited one, a sacred place in Sri Lanka, an entire temple dedicated to one of his teeth. It's called the Temple of the Tooth. Muhammad died in 632 AD in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Confucius died in 479 BCE in China. Hinduism, a religion that really has no single founder, but many influencers, never made a resurrection claim by about any of its leaders. Christianity is unique on this point. The central claim of Christianity is that Jesus Christ died on a cross, was dead for three days, that he overpowered death and came bodily out of the tomb, overcoming brutal scourges, massive loss of blood, and horrific lethal wounds. The evidence of this actual physical bodily resurrection is overwhelming. 
There is so much evidence of this historical event in the records that if a case were taken to court today and considered only on the merits of the physical evidence, as a matter of law, it would win the court case. Josh McDowell, a skeptic while in college, set out to prove the Bible was not accurate history. In his research, he found so much overwhelming evidence of the accuracy of the biblical record, including the resurrection that he converted and wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. <clears throat> Consider this. A huge stone, probably weighing in the neighborhood of two tons, way bigger than any single man could manage, was rolled away from the opening of the tomb. <clears throat> the Bible says that an angel did it. A squad of armed Roman soldiers dutifully guarding the tomb that was sealed by the uh, Herod's seal on threat of death for dereliction of duty were overpowered and became like dead men so that Jesus was able to emerge from the tomb without resistance. <clears throat> A group of women, Luke says it was four, five, maybe even six, first came to the tomb early Sunday morning. They found it empty and ran to report that Jesus was alive. This fact, reported in all four Gospels, is actually profound. Why? Because in those days, women were considered unreliable witness, witnesses by the local contemporary standards, and their testimony was never used as credible evidence. So anyone spinning a lie about Jesus' resurrection would never have reported that women were the first witnesses. There's only one reason to include this detail, and that is this. It was true. Jesus was recognized by his friends. They were not all delusional and strung out on psychedelic mushrooms. He asked them to look at his wounds. Even the doubter, Thomas, who said, unless I see his wounds, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Even him, was, he was convinced. He became a missionary to South India. Jesus ate bread with his disciples to prove he was physically alive. He was seen over a period of 40 days by more than 500 people. He spent time with them, he taught with them, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit, and he even gave them the great commission that we refer to almost every time we gather. Probably the most compelling fact in all of this evidence is that the 11 remaining disciples the apostles, and many others for decades after the resurrection boldly proclaimed that Jesus was alive. They never recanted. Ten of the original apostles were executed for their faith. Only John died a natural death on the Isle of Patmos. None of them ever recanted. The resurrection was, in fact, necessary. Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, he writes perhaps one of the most powerful arguments in Scripture about why Christ's resurrection was necessary, even pivotal to our faith. Their letter was written over 20 years after the resurrection, and some people, ironically, were still debating the issue which confirms to me that skepticism is always going to be alive and well. Unfortunately, most of the time it's not based upon fact, it's based upon prejudice. Even when God unmistakably displays his power, Paul writes, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He then goes on and makes his case for the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection. He says, according to the scriptures, Jesus died. He was buried, and he raised on the third day. He continues and said, he was seen by Peter. And then to the twelve, he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time, most of whom are still alive today, Paul says. He appeared to James. And then to all the apostles. And then Paul writes this poignant little word. He said, last of all, he appeared to me. Now, 
What does that mean? Although, you know, they were contemporaries, Paul and Jesus never actually physically met in a face-to-face, shake, your, shake each other's hand kind of encounter. <clears throat> this four years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, about A.D. 34, is when Paul met Jesus on a Damascus road. And that encounter with Jesus was so powerful for Paul that 20 years later he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church, still passionate, still convinced. Down through the centuries, millions and millions of people have met Jesus in this way. Skeptics may argue that such experiences are subjective, but to those who have met Jesus, it is as real as life itself. Many of us have those testimonies. Paul continues in his letter in chapter 15 to Corinth. He, he says, he plays the devil's advocate a little bit, and he says, if there's no resurrection, then Christ isn't raised either. He's kind of saying, you know, if the Sadducees are right, if Christ was not raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are liars, and your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And those who have died already in faith are lost forever. Whew. Paul concludes this attack on skeptical thinking by saying this. If we only have hope in Christ in this life, we are the most pitiful people on the planet. So the resurrection is important. The resurrection confirms Jesus' redemptive work. He died on the cross for our sins. And that work of redemption, that substitutionary work, is confirmed by the resurrection. It confirms the reality of God's forgiveness, the reality of a new life that he offers, the reality of heaven, the reality of eternity. We ask these questions, is there life after death, or is life just a pointless accident of measureless time and relentless evolution? Do we live beyond the bounds of physical existence, or is it all over when our lungs breathe their last and our bodies return to the dust? Do we have a soul? Is there eternity? Does God exist? And if he does, does he even care about mankind? Like Paul, who died in Rome as a prisoner, like the apostles who were lost their lives through their faith, I believe the answer is yes. Jesus is alive and full of kindness and on a mission to save the world. beginning at Christmas and ending at the resurrection. This is what the resurrection is about. Heaven is real. Eternity is real. Jesus paid the price for sin and rose from the dead to demonstrate his power over sin and mortality. He ascended into heaven and is now seated, the Bible says, at the right hand of God. This is our promised redemption. This is our promised future. God wants us to live with him forever. In my new book, White Picket Fences, I wrote about the death of my grandpa Stolzfus, my mom's dad, in 1986. He had just come, we had just come home from Asia to visit, and my mom called, and we drove from Indiana, 600 miles to Pennsylvania, to visit my grandpa, who had just been sent home from the hospital to die. He was 91 years old. He had lived his entire life as a follower of Jesus. He was a part-time minister. He had worked a farm. He had raised a family in the Mennonite community. He helped plant 12 churches and supported our family when we went to the mission field. Here's what I wrote in my book as a tribute to him. 
When we got to the house, Grandma met us at the door. We exchanged hugs and hellos, and then Beth took our two children aside while, with Grandma while I went into Grandpa's bedroom. His eyes were closed when I approached the bed. The attending nurse had just sedated him for the night, so he might not be very responsive, she said. I took Grandpa's left hand and squeezed it gently. Hi, Grandpa, I said. This is Doug. I wanted to come and see you. He lay on his back, eyes closed, breathing steadily, unresponsive. I was glad to be by his bedside and had things I wanted to say, but it felt odd talking to him this way. But I pressed forward, first thanking him for everything I could think of, his example, his encouragement, being available to us, everything he had done for me as a child and for our family since. Grandpa's nurse sat quietly in a corner chair during the monologue. I wasn't sure if Grandpa heard anything. I sighed, continued, Grandpa, I prayed for many years that you would live to see the coming of Jesus, but now it doesn't look like that's going to happen, so I want to pray for you and release you to go to be with him in heaven. I prayed a short prayer, and when I finished, he stirred. It was a subtle but immediate response, one quiet event following another, not unlike the rustling in a church crowd after the benediction. Grandpa stirred, and then he winced and opened his eyes. He squeezed my hand ever so slightly and, well, began to die. The nurse stepped forward and checked his pulse. He's dying, she said. She left the room and returned with Grandma, who rushed in to the other side of the bed, grasped Grandpa's right hand with both of hers, and leaned in close. Oh, Aaron, she cried as her tears rolled down her wrinkled cheeks. She hovered over him, stroking his hand, and together we waited in sacred silence while he entered into eternity. Our secularized, scientific, and educational, this is what I wrote after that, our secularized, scientific, and educational communities tell us that human beings are nothing more than biological tissue. A fluke of millions of years evolved from primal goo, a now intelligent life form bound to a random blue planet. We are told that the human heart beats two billion times during an average 75 years between birth and death through passion and pain, and that the last beat of that heart ends our temporal animal existence. Against such an ocean of knowledge and culture, it is hard to argue for faith, for God, and for eternity. But there I stood beside Aaron F. Stalsus, my grandpa, in quiet awe as he passed through a metaphysical doorway from earthly life to divinity and his realm, the end of all frail, uh, the end of frail physical existence and to continue an eternal one. The experience starkly st- offered stark clarity to me that life is more than flesh and blood and death and earth. Can I prove this empirically? No, but neither can the evolutionists prove otherwise. God is inherently unprovable. We weren't around 15 billion years ago or even 6,000 to observe the goings-on. Recorded history spans mere thousands of years. What do we really know? We childishly and sometimes arrogantly make broad assumptions and projections about the grand subject of origins. I'm not against the speculations, but all things being equal, faith and heaps of humility are much better options. You know, there's a superhuman, superhero hope in each one of us that somebody, somewhere, somehow will overcome the mundane natural and do something supernatural. When I was a kid, I worshipped Superman. I almost, you know, put on his outfit and a red towel on my shoulders and almost jumped off my garage roof to see if I could be that guy. This generation worships the one from the Matrix, or X-Men, or Batman, or Iron Man, or the Guardians of the Galaxy. We know they are make-believe stories, but inside of us we wish they were real. There is this subtle longing for the one to be real. The resurrected Jesus is God's answer to our dream of superhuman life. 
of life that outlasts the boundaries of mortality, that cheats the finality of death, and gives us access to eternity, that place we have always known existed, but has been just beyond our reach. Jesus' resurrection unlocked humanity's greatest mystery and made it accessible to everybody. Peter writes, the Apostle Peter writes in his first letter, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Wow. A short time after Luke 24, the once failed disciples who ran and hid the night of Jesus' betrayal now boldly stand in Jerusalem's streets declaring this, This man whom you put to death by nailing him to a cross, God has raised from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was not possible for death to keep its hold on him. (laughs) If sin and death could only be solved by Christ's sacrifice, then the resurrection confirms that the problem was solved. Tim Keller, in his book, King's Cross, writes this. Jesus had risen, just as he told him he would. After a criminal does his time in jail and fully satisfies the sentence, the law has no more claim on him and he walks out free. Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins. That was an infinite sentence. But he must have satisfied it fully because on Easter Sunday he walked out free. The resurrection was God's way of stamping paid in full right across history so that nobody could miss it. The resurrection of Jesus is the very center of the Christian message and that that is that Jesus who was crucified is risen from the dead. And now we are freely offered forgiveness of our sins. We are freely offered a new life that lasts forever. We are freely offered and given a new hope that in this life and in that which is to come, and we have something to offer the world around us, a message of hope, a message we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, what a privilege it is to celebrate on a a single day today your birth and your death and resurrection. The good news of Jesus Christ, it overwhelms us. It mystifies us. It confuses us. It clarifies to us. It challenges us and it gives us peace all at the same time. I pray for each person in this room, Lord, that you, this week, would nudge us a little more closely to yourself and all that you have done. Because, Lord, we, we, cannot, we, cannot, we cannot get through this life without you. Thank you for coming close to us, even when we were far from you. Thank you for taking the initiative. Without an invitation, you came looking for us, seeking for us. We welcome you into our lives, Lord, and we give you permission to nag us, to stay near, and never let us go. In your name.